And I'm going to be talking about Marine Land now. Okay. Marine I, Land of the Pacific. Nothing about it. I still don't know anything about it. I was hoping you knew everything. That's something I riffed my way through it. <laughs> I was hoping to talk about that I was bear some more. I thought that would carry me. <laughs> so give a man to fish and he'll eat for a day. Teach uh, a man to build a fish based amusement park and he'll probably end up the subject of a documentary about a marine animal abuse. <laughs> oh my God. You had me at uh, abuse? <laughs> <laughs> Long before the events of Blackfish, when the only trick a whale was used for was being made into candles and perfume, a sea creature based amusement park opened up in 1938 named marine land that location you guessed it florida it was started yeah, i think you're doing something wrong about this research no, no i'm this one's about epcot center <laughs> it was started by a man named Ilya tolstoy no relation oh wait no yes no. relation is there this is leo tolstoy's grandson really and he started an amusement park in florida united states of america about about whales i can see a connection <laughs> everything i remember about tolstoy <laughs> it was the best of parks it was the worst of parks is that tolstoy <laughs> no uh, that's dickens is it then what to- what i gotta look that up now what did tolstoy write he wrote war and peace is that war and peace it's not war and peace isn't it oh maybe i'm thinking of a tale of two cities i'm thinking of a tale of two kitties it's a tale of two cities who wrote a tale of two cities was it tolstoy it's dickens Oh, how yeah. does War and yeah. Peace start? It was the best of war. It was the worst <laughs> of war. He did write War and Peace, but he also wrote Anna Karenina. No, 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 find that hey out. i wanted i couldn't move on without knowing that <laughs> so the leo toy Sto- Tol- leo toy story's grandson his partner was cornelius vanderbilt whitney of the vanderbilt family oh my god what is this? yeah their park in florida was so successful that they decided to try out a west coast location and Ilya tolstoy himself came out to la and started scouting around for a good location a tolstoy was, a tolstoy in, LA. was in la yeah. tolstoy too the, clearly this is the worst of times nah, it's not even him <laughs> <laughs> we'll never know what tolstoy wrote so the area he found it was right on the water in Palos Verdes. The $3.5 million construction began on June 1st, 1953, and on August 28th, 1954, Marine Land of the Pacific opened to 15,000 visitors. The following week was declared Marine Land of the Pacific Week, and it was off to the races. Fish races, that is. The park itself... They, <laughs> they get very confused. They lose interest <laughs> real quick. The park itself featured three sections designed by our old friend William Pereira. So one of the things there was a 12-unit motel. One was the main building, and one was the Catalina Room, which overlooked the ocean and I assume Catalina Island. This was the setting of hundreds of weddings and parties over the years. There was also a Porpoise Room Cocktail Lounge and the Marineland Restaurant, which had seashells and starfish all over the ceiling, still living. There was a 250-foot-long pier that they built out into the ocean to dock their capture boat, which was called the Geronimo. They captured some 4,000 fish of 250 different species and 110 mammals of 11 species. To house their prisoners, they had two giant tanks that had fresh fresh seawater pumped in and out of them at 2,000 gallons every minute. One of these was 250 feet wide and could hold a million gallons of water, making it the world's largest holding tank at the time. Wow. That's pretty modest. Everything you've said, I'm like, Ooh, after doing all this research, I'm like, that sounds expensive. Pumping water in and out? <laughs> expensive. We gotta raise the prices. <laughs> <laughs> Little kitty's butts in here. <laughs> we, we, maybe we can make a, you know, a dolphin fight a lion or something. <laughs> <laughs> so one of the tanks was heated for non-native fish and one was unheated for native fish. Um, and then you could eat the heated one. <laughs> like really heated. Heated, like crabs or like there. a hot pot <laughs> this was the world's largest hot pot <laughs> don't touch it don't touch it <laughs> there were stadiums around these tanks that could hold 1500 fish lovers with 1500 more windows beneath the surface spread across three floors to view what they called the mansion of the deep to watch all the animals changing their clothes Ooh. there were underwater feeding shows there was the sea arena where they staged porpoise games and a seal circus oh my God. later on in 1966 they built the sky tower that could take 60 people at a time up 314 feet for a 360 degree view of the beautiful ocean and okay Palos Verdes. They started selling their own line. This is modest. <laughs> mm, modest. <laughs> they started selling their own line of aquarium products called Marineland Aquarium Products. And when they opened, they were only the second oceanarium ever to open in the United States, but they were the largest in the world. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. They are also considered to be California's first major theme park. What you were talking about was an, an amusement, amusement park. park. Yeah. This was a theme park, unless you could consider birds and beer the theme of Bush Gardens. No, this was before they didn't Bush stray Gardens. far from it. Yeah. This was monorail. before Bush Gardens. There's before bu- Bush Gardens. <sighs> I have riffing. No, God. We'll just have riff tracks at the end. We can do commentary on these episodes. <laughs> so now, even though they had a porpoise, they still felt like they were missing a purpose. 
You wrote that down. Did Microsoft Word didn't flag it? Clippy, get out of here. I know what <laughs> yeah, I'm doing. What I'm do- <laughs> you're like Luke turning off the computer. Daniel, your your joke censoring system is off. What's wrong? <laughs> Nothing. I know what I'm doing, Clippy. It's funny. It's People fun. will like it. It's funny. <laughs> Use the edit button. <laughs> anyway, that missing purpose was to have a whale in captivity. That oh. was their purpose. It was fine having dolphins and the like, but if you really wanted to draw in crowds, you had to have a giant whale. Just ask Pinocchio or that guy from the Bible. If you want to draw in the crowd, you really had to commit a crime against the ocean. We all commit crimes against the ocean. Where do you think your trash goes, friend, huh? Where do you think it goes when you flush them down the (laughs) sewer? In 1957, the Geronimo, being manned by great sailor names, Frank Bracado and Boots Caladrino, they caught a pilot whale off the coast of Catalina that was promptly given the name Bubbles. She was 12 feet long and weighed 1,600 pounds. She was the first pilot whale ever to be caught and kept alive in captivity and was trained to perform in shows and billed as the world's first trained performing whale. The Bubbles show is really what put them over the edge and boosted their attendance and the money brought in from Bubbles is what allowed them to build the $500,000 Sea Arena which had the Porpoise Games in 1958. Bubbles was rewarded with a statue in front and all the captivity she could handle. (laughs) They got a couple other pilot whales too named Squirt and Bimbo but in 1964 two thirds of the earth was changed forever when SeaWorld opened in San Diego and just how fish gave way to dolphins who gave way to pilot whales suddenly the hot new thing was the bigger scarier orca. SeaWorld started their Shamu show in 1965 in Marineland, which was just a couple hours north. They now had to have an orca or get left behind. And for three years, they were until 1968. Marineland finally managed to capture an orca. He weighed 14,000 pounds and was named Orky. Then just a year later, on December 11th, 1969, a four-year-old female orca was captured who they named Corky. (sighs) She eventually grew to be 8,000 pounds Orky, the male whale, um, with a lot of tail. He was described as being very proud and often moody. He had a reputation of shoving his trainers around when he was annoyed, which he would warn them beforehand by his eyes would turn blood red Oof! when he got angry and then he'd push you. The Hulk of whales, but he doesn't need to grow anymore. He's just always in the Hulk state. That's my secret. I'm always whale. <laughs> the one thing I know about the stupid Avengers. It's not stupid, it's great. <laughs> in, it's stupid. In 1970... <laughs> in 19, uh, I said it's stupid. In 1970, he pinned one of his trainers underwater for four minutes and nearly killed them. Corky, on the other fin, was more easygoing. She was shy at first, but once she warmed up, she was very playful and required a lot of attention. She'd play hide and seek with the trainers. With they like they'd tap on different parts of the glass, and then she'd run over. Not run, but she'd yeah. swim over the noise. Uh, she could run on water though she had legs <laughs> hide and seek and drownings were all fine but if the park wanted to up the ante even more they'd need more orcas and just their luck Orky was a male and more Corky. <laughs> Next thing, super orcas. Orcas who can box. (laughs) Corky was a female. Get out. So their new training was how to get jiggy with it. Gross. On February 28th, 1977, Corky had her first child, making it the first live orca to be born in captivity. However, after a few days, Corky started getting mean with the baby and kept attacking her. So they moved it into its own tank and the baby died just a couple days later. It lived for 16 days. In all, Corky and Orky had six babies. All of them died. I don't know if that's just how whales are or it's whales in captivity but it probably didn't help that they found out years later that orky and corky were cousins uh i just heard a banjo in my head (laughs) underwater banjo (laughs) (laughs) blah 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 blah. gross all of this is gross and it's really upsetting me it's gonna get a lot more upsetting no Uh, (laughs) is that how stories work (laughs) trigger warning which is another whale they had with only a couple orcas and facing competition from sea world and another amusement park called disney something that were both within a couple hours of way attendance started dripping <laughs> dipping but dripping is still funny <laughs> it seems like i should have i meant to write dripping clippy, clippy. how'd you let that one go <laughs> please sir don't untangle me in the early 60s they were getting a million visitors a year but by the late 60s the place was looking run down and by the early 70s it was becoming too expensive to operate the park and this is when the great parade of changing hands again comes oh 1971 it was sold to the hollywood turf club which were the people who owned hollywood park then they in turn leased the park to 20th century Fox, who ran it until 1977 when it reverted back to the Turf Club, who then sold it in October of that year to the Kroger Company of Ralph's fame, oh, wow. and also to Taft Broadcasting. They sold it for $5 million. Now, Taft Broadcasting also owned Hanna-Barbera. So on October 31st, 1977, they closed down the park for remodeling and gave the worst Halloween scare to many of their employees and laid them off. <laughs> then on May 20th, tw- on May, uh, trick, <laughs> the treat is your permanent vacation. The treat is this pink slip. Don't eat it. You'll need it's, it. It's strawberry flavored. Then on May 20th, 
27, 1978, they reopened under the new name Hanna-Barbera's Marine Land, oh. and the park's mascots became Hanna-Barbera characters, Yay. a la Knott's Berry Farm with the peanuts. They also added something called the Family Adventure Swim, the Baja Reef that you could snorkel in, mm-hmm. and a marine animal care center. Did they have a Jabberjaw? Oh, uh, they had to have had. I don't know if they had sharks, though. How could you not have sharks? Yeah. Call them in the 50s and tell them to have a shark instead <laughs> uh, of hello. Uh, whales. 50s. 50, no, this is the 70s. Sorry, I called the wrong number. <laughs> <laughs> so with Hanna-Barbera, the, it boosted their attendance back up for a while. But in 1981, they sold to a Hong Kong company. It was Hong Kong Fui. Uh, Hanna-Barbera, yeah. Yeah, how fitting. They didn't like that character. They sold Well, the, why? He was the number one super guy. He was also a janitor. <laughs> What's not to like? Yeah. They sold to this Hong Kong company named Far East Hotels and Entertainment Limited. That's a dumb name. Uh, no, it's change, catchy. Though. They said they were going to update the whole park, but I ended up just giving it a new coat of paint. And this is where the story gets cruel and heartbreaking so uh the park changed hands again but this time to someone who had had his eyes on it for a long time the company was a book publishing firm named harcourt brace jovanovich the man was the titular william jovanovich he was from montenegro and it showed (laughs) he brought a yugoslavia at war mentality to the business world of america he was not well liked of of a business at at all he was 80s capitalism at its finest gordon gecko yeah in one incident he was known for he had lunch with a lower level official in his company who did didn't get along with his boss of that division. Yeah. So Jovanovich encouraged him to overthrow the boss and take over that division. And this guy didn't want to do that. So Jovanovich put his hand on him and told him, you know, if we were guerrillas fighting each other in the hills of Yugoslavia during World War II, I'd kill you in 15 seconds. <laughs> well, you know, if I was a boxing bear, I'd hit you right in the jaw and you go down. Right in the jabber jaw. The jabber jaw. <laughs> I'd uh, hit you right in the honey pot. <laughs> That's scary. Yeah. We sca- didn't I didn't address how scary that was. Scary man. A few days later, Jovanovich fired all the top management in his general books division in what became known as the Monday Massacre. He also had no public relations department in the company so that he was inaccessible to the public. But on top of being a book publisher in 1976, his company dished out $51 million and bought SeaWorld. Now, this was a time when SeaWorld was planning to open up a new location in San Antonio. So they needed more of what they were famous for. Mm-hmm. Shamus. Shamu. <laughs> Shamu. 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 They needed as many orcas as they could get. The problem was in 1972, they passed the Marine Protection Act, which made it illegal to capture sea animals from the wild to put in amusement parks and the like. So SeaWorld had to rely on breeding the orcas that it already had. San Diego already had three orcas, but as we know, breeding in captivity was tricky and it wasn't working. By the mid 80s, there were only five captive orcas in the country not owned by SeaWorld. There was one at the Miami Sea Aquarium, two at Marine World, Africa, USA, and Vallejo, California. But both... The, hmm. I guess just whitewash history. Sorry, I, the, my Zodiac trigger went off. I know that. <laughs> but both of those females in Vallejo, they were female. Both oh. of those females were female. And then, uh, explain one more time. <laughs> then there was Orky and Corky, and they were the only proven breeding couple. So those were the ones left in the country. On top of that, in April 1986, Winston the Orca died at SeaWorld, Florida, and he was the only male breeder any of those parks had. So suddenly, Orky was the only breeding orca in captivity in the country and it, maybe the world. Boy, it's it sounds great, <laughs> it's, but it's a lot of work. SeaWorld had offered to buy them, Orky and Corky, repeatedly yeah. over the years for anywhere between $1 to $2 million but every time they were rejected because they were the centerpiece of marine land like they wouldn't function without them but now the park was so desperate and it was time to shake fins with the devil shark (laughs) on December 30th 1986 the park was sold to Jovanovich's company HBJ for 23.4 million dollars marine land convinced themselves that this was a good thing because HBJ spent lavishly on SeaWorld and marine land really needed money they were even told before the deal that their plan was to pump $750,000 into the park for repairs and not that much would change that included Jovanovich's reputation. All he ever wanted from Marineland were Corky and Orky, yeah. and that became very clear very fast. On January 12th, so keep the timeline. This was December 30th. It was sold. Jo- okay. On January 12th, a memo went out in the park that on the 20th, the Orca Stadium was going to be closed for repairs. Then on the 19th, they got a new memo saying that on the 20th, the whole park was going to be closed because oh. the two Orcas are going to be transferred to SeaWorld San Diego. They're no longer <laughs> Marineland property. All employees were forbidden from telling anybody or else they'd be fired and in the middle of the night on January 20th 1987 the orca tank was mostly drained so that they had nowhere to hide and Orky was craned out and Orky and Corky had lived together for 18 years at this point so when Orky started getting 
taken, Corky freaked out and she started, she jumped into the stretcher with him and both of them were crying. The oh, whales were crying. Oh my God. And uh, I, fortunately or unfortunately, they took both of them. So they put them on a truck and drove them down to San Diego. The reason HBJ gave for moving them in the middle of the night was because the caravan would have taken up too many lanes of traffic. And the reason they gave for taking them, period, was that SeaWorld needed them to breed. Of course, it did not sit well with anybody. No. People working at the park didn't like it, of course. Fans of the park didn't like it. And the city of Palos Verdes felt betrayed. Marineland brought a lot of money into the area. And without Orky and Corky, the park's not going to survive. HBJ insisted that they'd replace the Corky and Orky shows with the Bubbles and Bangles, the Pilot Whale show. But Pilot Whale weren't... to dish out cash for Bubbles? Come on. What, throw away my paycheck to see Bubbles? Come on, what is this? No one wants to see Pilot Whales. I want to see that, that sexy black and white. <laughs> Citizens to save Marineland was formed and hundreds protested what was happening. LAUSD schools threatened to boycott HBJ published textbooks and several schools in California like the English department at El Camino College actually did. Mm -hmm. Johnny Carson was making jokes about HBJ on The Tonight Show. It was a public relations catastrophe. Yeah. They went back on their own given reason for moving the orcas and now they said that they had been in danger at Marineland because the tank was too small. In response, an open letter from a protester in the LA Times said, I have a proposal. Why not put William Jovanovich and Orky in the same tank and may the best species win? <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. The situation was spiraling out of control and things got worse from there. Six days after the whale transfer, the city council met and demanded to HBJ that if they're going to close down the park, they have to have a plan for redevelopment within 30 days and it would have to be torn down within two years. HBJ's response... Two days later, Marineland employees were told the park would be closing its doors forever wow. on March 1st. Jeez. So this is within two months. Two months. Or everything. three months. The company said that renovating the park would cost $25 million, but to justify that cost, attendance would have to rise 50%. But they said that would be impossible without orcas, which they removed. <laughs> there was no winning. Then on February 3rd, Marineland General Manager John Corcoran met at HBJ headquarters to discuss his role in the company after the park was then closed. Then he had to fight a gorilla. So he went to discuss his role where he was informed that he would have no role because he was fired. Oh boy. That same day back at Marineland, the marketing director came back from her lunch break to find her car blocked in by a security truck and when she went inside she was told that she and her entire division had to clear out their desk by 5 p.m. that day and their cars were searched by security guards to make sure they didn't take any files with them. <sighs> then on February 11th, the remaining employees were gathered for a meeting in the Dolphin Arena but instead of dolphins on stage, it was a representative of SeaWorld flanked by two security guards with more security stationed all along the upper rim of the bowl. That's not a good show. No, it's a great show. <laughs> this is how James Bond villains take care of their employees. Everyone gathered here was told they were fired. Around 300 people lost their job all at once. <sighs> a couple hours later, they found out that instead of closing on March 1st, like they originally said, the park was instead closing at 5 p.m. the next day. Oof. The reason being that they claimed to have received three bomb threats and it was no longer safe to operate the park. That was never confirmed by anybody other than them. People gathered outside the park on February 12th, 1987 to protest, but in the first promise they kept, the park closed forever at 5 p.m. that day. So basically, Jovanovich and his company flat out lied about everything they said was going to happen, and they wanted to cut and run away from the situation quick. On February 24th, Jovanovich put the land up for sale and put his nicer son in charge of dealing with the rest of it as he receded back into his coffin of blood and <laughs> cocaine. On March 5th, they took down the iconic entrance sign, and on May 14th, it was sold to a developer from Arizona named James G. Monahan for $24.5 million who planned to build a resort on the land that incorporated parts of what remained of the park like the Baja Reef. One of Monahan's conditions for buying it was that HBJ had to give $3 million to help pay for a new marine animal care center that became named the Marine Mammal Care Center which is still operating today on the Fort MacArthur grounds in San Pedro which I, I went there once. Oh, I yeah? stumbled upon it. There's a bunch of seals. They That's bit me. Cool. They bit me. They told me it was my fault. <laughs> on February 11th, 1988, demolition began began on the park. Most of the icons of the park were destroyed, including a big Wyland mural. The Catalina Room still stood and kept on being used for banquets and the whale tail and two dolphin statues at the entrance stood for a while, but now they're kept in storage by the city of Rancho Palos Verdes. September 28th, 1989, HBJ sold off SeaWorld to a new company, Anheuser-Busch, for $1.1 $1. $1 billion. Yeah. Over. 
<laughs> crossover from a story from before <laughs> in the same 20 episode. minutes ago <laughs> the ruin yeah, 20 minutes is generous the ruins of- this is a modest episode today <laughs> the ruins of Marineland stood for a couple decades in June 1995 they tore down the sky tower because it was a hazard for planes flying around people were warned like don't fly near the coast over there you might hit the you sky hit tower sky tower <laughs> that thing that closed down the marines from Camp Pendleton used the ruins to run amphibious landing drills three or four times a year imagine we turn it into a fish but we still gotta work <laughs> We're going to recreate the evolution of uh, humanity <laughs> three or four times a year. Camp Hollywood used it whenever it needed to Stupid. also. <laughs> Film there was Baywatch, okay. Lost, The O.C., MTV's Beach House, The Lost Boys Cave was below the park. Oh, They filmed Pearl Harbor, Spider-Man, Pirates of the Caribbean, The Rock, Charlie's Angels, The Aviator, and Con Air there. Okay. I like in, two of those things. <laughs> Charlie's Angels and Pearl Harbor. In <laughs> June 2003, Rancho Palos Verdes finally approved the building of a $200 million resort there. And in July 2008, all that remained, including the Catalina Room, was torn down. And then on June 12, 2009, the Terranea Resort opened up after costing $480 million in the end. There's even a restaurant there called Nelson's, named after Lloyd Bridges' character, who is a trainer at Marineland on the show Sea Hunt, which ran from 1958 to 61. And it was filmed at Marineland. Wow, if you okay. want to see it, go watch watch binge it that's the only way to yeah, watch sea you hunt. gotta watch it all at once yeah Others. you don't want to miss out on the conversation you can also listen to our podcast talking sea hunt but what happened to all the animals scene hunt sorry go ahead <laughs> but what happened to all the man all the manimals they were fired the manimal i told you the manimals got fired all the animals once marine closed let's cut back to 1987 here's a heavy dose of sadness. February 18th, all remaining animals started to be shipped to their new home at SeaWorld, but not even this was handled well. The trainers at Marineland gave specific instructions for their individual animals, but SeaWorld did not listen. They begged them not to put one of their dolphins, Sundance, in with the other dolphins because he was the subdominant male. It was the Greg and Daniel of the pod, <laughs> and he wouldn't be able to defend himself. Of course, they put him in with the rest of them, and one day after he got there, another dolphin attacked him, and he died of a fracture skull and cerebral hemorrhage oh my god they could do that dolphins are vicious okay (laughs) (laughs) i've been telling everybody nobody believes me (laughs) but dolphins are vicious three days later a female dolphin named echo died and soon after so did two harbor seals and three other animals SeaWorld accepted responsibility for sundance's death but the rest they said oh they just got sick marine land trainers should have been there for the transition but they wouldn't let them be there as for the two that this whole war was fought over SeaWorld tried to rename orky and corky to shamu and namu but fans protested so much that they backed down and I believe they were the only orcas there to not perform under the name Shamu and Namu. However, SeaWorld had a much worse record with orcas than Marineland did. Orky had been living in Marineland for nearly 20 years. SeaWorld orcas lived an average of eight and a half years. So Orky didn't do so well there and in 1988 he died. Corky, on the other hand, had pretty much became queen of SeaWorld. <laughs> like she dominated the whole place. When she first came in, she was kind of shy as she is. Yeah, we know. But she was hated by another orca named can do five it's a then, robot then it, yeah, it's a, it was the first robotic <laughs> orca Wea. did you say way way i was gonna say way <laughs> <Wea. the> <laughs> boom, boom, boom. <laughs> can do five hates her yeah august 1989 they're about to go on a show can do five charges at corky and corky was so strong that can do five fractured her own jaw on her and that <sighs> sent a bone flying through her artery and she bled to death so oh that's the end of Can Do 5. God. <laughs> you don't mess with Corky. I guess not. This was the first instance of an orca ever attacking another orca. <laughs> then in a weird power move, Corky ended up raising Can Do 5's daughter as her own. <laughs> <laughs> Corky, queen of SeaWorld. Oh, Corky's wow. still alive. She's 52 years old. That's making her the oldest whale in any SeaWorld. She's yeah. the biggest female there. They call her the Beast. But she also has the kind of sad title of being the longest held captive orca in history. Nice. Apparently, she knows that because in 1993, they f- they found her pod that she came from. And they recorded sounds of them talking and they played it for her. And when she heard it, she started shaking and she cried. Oh. That's Marine Land of the Pacific. Wow. I want to blow up SeaWorld <laughs> after I free all the animals. I want to free Orky or Corky. <laughs> Whichever one's there. You know, I don't even care. I lost interest in the story. 